morning team. Um, welcome. A, uh, I'm going to talk a wee bit about um, pre-purchase boat inspection. That's uh, primarily due to a feedback from the Pearls of Boating Wisdom course um, that I'm running here in New Zealand, a hull boat maintenance course um, that I'm going to slowly bring online for everybody. Um, but this is a module that I'm going to introduce my ex and new students to because we don't have time on the uh, on the course. So if you're in the situation where you're looking to buy a new boat, that's really where we're going. What, what are the considerations? What do I need to think about pre choosing a boat based on the considerations? What do I want to do with a boat? And my level of experience, am I able to handle this boat that I can afford? Or am I going to need to pay a skipper or somebody to come out with me? The idea of buying my perfect vessel that's far too big for me and I can't handle. And then I'm going to have my mate or friend or paid skipper or somebody come out with me a couple of times and gain the experience that I need to handle this thing yeah you you what is it 10,000 hours the the Japanese um, trade master says is going to be um, needed before you're gonna that's a long time you're not I'm not suggesting you need 10,000 hours to handle this boat correctly I'm suggesting that start with something smaller more easily handleable safer in conditions that you can um, safely keep your people safe on board then you, you're going to learn a lot quicker than three or four trips out on something way too big with trying to absorb information from someone else. As soon as that instructor leaves, what's going to happen? Right, park that one. We've chosen a type of boat. Well, sorry, a little bit more on that, sorry. The, the, the consideration, what do I want to do with this boat? Horses for courses. There are so many different... Well, there's every type... Of, I, I consider that there's every type of boat for every type of boating situation. The perfect mo match for the, for the perfect situation. And even within those categories, there's then a whole raft of um, levels of luxury and levels of um, scale, size. I can do something with a 20-footer that I can do with a 120-footer. Um... And with exactly the same levels of all of those things, the, the scalability changes, right? So the, we need to be really, really honest with ourselves at this stage. What do you, for the perceived length of ownership of this vessel, what do you perceive is going to be your um, to operational uh, parameters? What do you, who, do, who do you want to have on board? How many people do you want to have on board? Where do you want to go? Um, and, and what quite frequently can happen is we buy a vessel for one purpose and one family or friend situation that changes and we try and do the same thing. You'll soon learn that's not possible, right? And that's where we get into boat ownership changes. There is also a pitfall that I want to just highlight here, both in motorboat and yachts is that, uh, people can frequently be sold something especially by vendors um, way more interested in selling their boat than keeping you safe um, who will sell you a vessel that is not suitable for coastal or offshore passage making be very mindful that um, there is a whole raft of vessels out there uh, sailing yachts motorboats that do not meet the requirement for go offshore. Europe have just introduced a category system, A, B, C, D, um, of, uh, they're literally called, the categories are A, B, C, D. Um, this is the European Council um, MMO. They're tr they're, what they're trying to do is get, manufa and manufacturers now have to adhere to it with new boats, but there is so much old stock out there. New boats that are rated for inland waterways only, um, harbour conditions only, uh, near shore coastal conditions, and then offshore. All right, and and what you need to, those are the that's the categorization that I there's the pit the safety pitfall. There's YouTubers out there. I I don't want to put anybody down or, or talk badly to about about anybody, but there are YouTubers out there 
crossing oceans on vessels, filming the vessel falling apart around them with the, this is the camera, <laughs> filming the vessel falling apart around them. And you, you, boat experts are like, well, what are you doing in the open ocean on a vessel that's designed for near water harbour conditions or, or, or island, you know, tropical island um, sheltered conditions? <laughs> there's there's fundamental reasons why the furniture and the boat is falling apart when you're in the open ocean in in a in a storm right okay um so we've considered we're going to buy this particular vessel whatever this particular vessel and i'll try and talk through power boats and yachts at the same time um not trying to be too broad brushstroke about it but there's a lot of crossover obviously um why right so pre-purchase inspection other than the obvious of do i like this vessel what i'm also trying to consider uh, to get a picture of is what's it going to cost me on top of my purchase price to uh, bring this vessel up to the standard that i see fit for this vessel and for my level of usage all right um and that's budget restriction because you've you've got your purchase cost, and if the if the the cost to bring the boat up um, to the standard that you want um, exceeds your budget, then you're you're going to be in a, a bit of a hole. Um, add a <laughs> there's a uh, I I just crossed my mind. Add a hundred percent to what you think the boat the boat's going to cost you to bring up to um to speed, and that's sort of a. a, a uh, Murphy's Law rule of thumb sort of thing is whatever you think it's going to cost you add a good um, at least 100% on that but anyway let's talk through um, the, the categories of inspection that we're going to go around so we're going to go through the hull we're going to go through the rig if we're on a sailing boat and uh, if we're a motorboat we're going to talk about the engines we can cross over the engines depending on whether they're main engines in a, in a primary engines in a, um, a power vessel or auxiliary engine in a sailboat and we'll go through electrics and then we'll just try and bring all of that together. Um, obviously, there's all sorts of things like soft furnishings and stuff like that. But I think most of us have got the wealth of experience to uh, make our own mind up on that sort of stuff. Right. Hull inspection. Hull inspection. Um, we're wanting to try to find the damage that the owner, the current owner, either doesn't know about or does, isn't willing to tell you about all right that's the primary purpose of you going through the vessel lifting every component hatch floorboard boats are constructed with stringers and webs and uh, um, pieces of engineering that uh, join the, the hull shape the, the surface area of the hull together right so we've got all of these stringers we call them um, limbers another way of looking at it what we're looking for on those limbers and ev anywhere where you've got flat hull surface joining um with 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 construction on it along those lines if it's painted we're looking for cracks in the paint if it's fiberglass we're looking for cracks in the gel coat or fiberglass that's over the top flow coat or gel fiberglass that's over the top um if it's wood 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 and wood um we're looking for previous signs of water ingress um, and or uh, fasteners that are corroding in excessive speed compared to their um, surrounding components, um, meaning the rusty bits. If you've got if you've got a bunch of fasteners in a particular spot on a wooden boat that are showing up as, as corroding excessively quickly compared to their surrounding members then you've probably got an impact damage problem in that area cracks in glue cracks in star crazing on the inside so fiberglass back to fiberglass hull star crazing so the 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 fine crosshair cracks on the inside of a vessel is a really good sign that something's come up and 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 hit the side outside of the boat um and yeah, around these webs where the webs join the to the to the hull surface of the boat, we're looking for cracks at the ends of those to see if anything's moved or stressed. Now, fiberglass especially is extremely flexible um, and easily repaired. Uh, if we're looking at a steel-hulled vessel, 
you're looking at rust issues and plate thickness. Plate thickness is a very difficult thing to find without um, depth gauge um, equipment, um, which is where we're going to probably look to a surveyor um, if we think everything else, all of the other boxes are ticked with steel vessels. Don't forget on steel, one five millimeters of rust flake equals one millimeter of um, loss of main core material, all right? So it can look really, really bad and you actually haven't actually lost that much material. Okay, park steel, sorry. Fiberglass, um, yeah, very flexible, very easily repaired. Um, we've got this other problem called osmosis in fiberglass where water, um, fiberglass is hydroscopic. It can take up water and will do from brand new. The problem is in uncured properly cured fiberglass um, we get this um, blistering or pock marking if you get if you're not going to notice that probably unless you've got an extremely exceptionally bad case on um, an interior hull inspection you're going to have to that's that's the 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 surveyor going around the bottom of the boat tap 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 they're looking for um, voids and places where there shouldn't be hollow sounds and then they've got to find out what the hollow sound is that can be osmosis Osmosis generally occur. There's a rule, a rule of thumb that we can sort of put something. Just look for, if you can do research on hull numbers um, and, and and construction locations. Boats that were laid up in cold, damp countries during winter suffer more badly from osmosis than hot, dry construction conditions. Um, it's the final cure temperature of, of the construction. <laughs> Sorry, big lesson on osmosis. Get rid of that one. Um, we're looking for these impact damage. What am I, what's the cost of repair? Okay, so we figured this bit out. Um, and that's really what we're looking at in hull. Right, a little bit of a segue here. Um, rig, if we've got a sailing vessel, the rigging um, on the vessel connects to the hull of the vessel via chain plates. So literally lumps of uh, strips of steel bolted through um, generally not the outside of the vessel, although sometimes that is the case on uh, wood and concrete. Um, but inside the vessel, um, athwart ships, across ships, um, will have plates bolted out of it. Right, we need to know that those plates are in reasonable condition and we're going to try and expose those during this inspection, this pre-purchase inspection and just have a visual on there is the thing a ball of rust, alarm bells, or is it look all nice and good condition, all right? Um, rigging. Right, what the, so here's the big alarm bell that you may not know about. Um, rigging requires replacement to get insurance approximately eight to 10, every eight to 10 years. Um, catamarans, even sooner. Uh, uh, maximum being eight years, more like six years with most catamaran insurance. If you're trying to insure an, a, a rig on a or a boat, but if you're trying to insure a catamaran, the requirement for changing the standing rigging, that's all the wires that are holding the mast up, is six to eight years. On a monohull, um, it's more like eight to 10, maybe 12 years, depending on uh, the conditions, right? Why are we doing this? Stainless steel work hardens. So all of those fittings and the wire itself ages through normal boat use, okay? A boat that's been raced hard twice a week, every week, all summer long for 25 years, um, and the rig no one can tell you when the rigging has been changed, is gonna need the rigging changing very soon. Um, a person that can produce an invoice saying the rig was changed four years ago um, and I've only done gentle cruising since then, we're on a winner, right? And there's the two worlds apart of what we want to do. Generally, visually, on this boat inspect walk round in a couple of hours that we're doing, walk round and satisfy yourself that the rig's not hanging off in pieces and there's not rust erupting out of all of the fittings. That's a really good clue as to the age, um, not the age, of, of damage of the, the rigging that's gonna need changing. Is rust erupting out of the swages where the wire joins the metal components. 
Um, paperwork. It just comes down to paperwork. What can the owner produce for you saying when the, uh, when the thing's been done? Right. The next... Uh, the only other part of that if we is what's the condition of the furling gear because that's not part of the uh, the rig change for insurance requirements the furling gear how well does that sail come in and out hopefully if you're inspecting on a windless day you might just be able to run the head sill if it's got one in and out um, you're looking for corrosion where the drum at the bottom of the forestay uh, connects to the uh, the sail so we, do, we want that to be in mint condition because that's the highest stress loading point. Uh, gooseneck, where the boom joins the mast at that hinge, um, might also be, hang on a sec, I'm gonna have to pause this. Sorry about that, was it goose gooseneck um, inspection? We're looking for flogged out um, uh, pivot pins. All right, so we've got a pivot pin to allow the boom to go forwards and backwards, and we've got a pivot pin to allow the boom to go up and down, right? Um, slacken everything off, slacken the vang, slacken the kicking strap, um, topping lift loose, um, expose it if the sail's all hanging over it. Try and get a shoulder underneath the, the boom, and you're just trying to move this thing and see, have I got to do some engineering and or, and or replace the, the gooseneck? Um, yeah, uh, if you're going offshore, we're also looking for a possibly, this is again the cost of how, what's it going to be ready to get this boat ready for me. Um, has it got a trisail track next to the main track? Um, because we want a separate track for a trisail um, so that we can load a trisail up um, and leave the main in place for that um, six hour storm in a two week crossing. Um, that was if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not going offshore, it's all good. Um, so we're gonna change the rigging um, or, or need to prove that the rig is has got not too many hours on it. Okay, engines. Um, the main engine, um, let's just talk general engines. It can be a main engine of a powerboat, engine of an auxiliary. Right, I need to satisfy myself um, to, to not be meeting a, a, a massive cost load. I need to prove that the core engine, the pistons <laughs> and, and the block are in good condition, right? The ancillaries that go on the outside can be expensive, but they're nothing like as expensive as an engine replacement, all right? So is the core engine in reasonable condition? Cold start you are looking at the exhaust pipe when the agent or your friend start or the owner starts the engine all right and you want to try to satisfy you want to arrange on the phone that the owner isn't going to have been to the boat and warmed it up for you before you get there you want a cold genuine cold start to the point where you're going to expose the engine beforehand is it cold is it not cold if it's not cold can i come back and do a cold start on this please um why? Because that's going to tell you a whole lot about the injection equipment, the fuel injection equipment on a diesel engine. Um, if we're talking petrol engines, uh, we still want to know that the thing's going to start from cold. Right. Um, it's the best. The, we're proving all of the starter motor electrics. Everything is in the top conditions to get this thing started. You're going to want to start it from cold, not with all of the owner's tricks and tips. Um start the engine from cold you're looking at the exhaust what color is the exhaust uh, smoke for after that initial puff as the initial puff of smoke comes down the exhaust pipe all right and for the next 30 seconds what what um, is it uh, there should be a there could be a, a, a tiny puff of white blue or black smoke at this point all right all of these are all pointing towards blue smoke is going to say I'm burning oil um, white smoke is going to say that my injectors are not um, atomizing properly, they're not spraying properly. And black smoke is going to say, probably a tiny puff of black smoke on a, on a good operating engine is okay at, for the first half a second, so one tiny little puff. But after that you don't want to see any, any more black smoke, blocked oil filters and uh, blocked oil filters, blocked air filters or overloaded um, engine.
Okay, engines warming up. Um, you're alongside. You're probably not allowed at this initial inspection to take the vessel out. Um, a motorboat, I'd almost certainly want to go out, um, as in this is a non-sailing boat. Um, a motorboat, I'm going to want to go for a drive to prove that these engines are okay. Because um, the core difference is with a sailing boat, we can leave the stern lines on the dock and go to half throttle under power, generally, unless we're buying a super yacht, in which case you're probably not listening to this video. Um, we can we can run the engine at half power um, and allow the engine to warm up under load, all right? We want to do that. We want to have the engine at, come up to full operating temperature. We don't need to thrash the thing at the dock. Half throttle cruising, so we'll thrash it when we go out for a sea trial. Half throttle, in forward gear, does this thing maintain its uh, normal operating temperature quite happily for a good half an hour, all right? Um, if it's starting to get hot in that time, you know that you're going to be into fixing coolers and um, the rest of the cooling system and things like this. The next part of the equation is my, um, after my half an hour is up and I'm satisfied that the cooling of the engine is good, hopefully I've got an oil pressure, this is an engine oil pressure needle to look at. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the throttle back from that operating temperature to um, idle in gear so still leaving it in gear at idle and I want to see that so I'm now checking the lowest oil pressure that this engine's going to see all right and um, we need to see it stay somewhere on the scale notoriously the the instrument that we're looking at is inaccurate um, but if the if the, the needle's been sitting halfway up the scale which is what we would hope whatever the scale is, halfway up the scale, um, we want to see the needle stay on the scale and not disappear right down onto the stop. We want to know that there's at least a couple of PSI of oil pressure left at that hot idle situation. If you can't do that, we need to be talking to our mechanic friends about borrowing and putting in a um, oil pressure gauge to prove that at this hot idle situation, there is still oil pressure. This is one of the core, um, the, sorry, the main inspection points of the core engine is how worn is how worn out is my engine, all right? If everything else is functioning absolutely perfectly and uh, you're on the verge of, is this engine okay? Uh, 5,000, 10,000 hours worth of um, counted on the, on the engine hour clock, you you and you start to see that we know that we're in, you start to see the oil pressure dropping all the way down to zero you know that you're into a, a full rebuild or replacement of the engine the ancillaries around the engine um we can replace starter motors you want the owner to re if you can't get the engine started you want the owner to be replacing it before purchase um alternators uh coolers Gearboxes, gearbox can be nearly the same cost as an actual a core bare engine, right? Um, so we want to know that this gearbox is absolutely fine as well. And we're going to test it. Um, we want to know that the gearbox goes into and comes out of gear easily. Um, the coming out of gear is as important as the going into gear, depending on your uh, type of gearbox. There are types of gearbox out there that if it struggles to come out of gear, you're into a full engine, uh, full gearbox rebuild. Um, and then we want to know that it's not going to slip under full strain. So there's going to be no um, give in the gearbox, which is another type of gearbox with, um, high, with pressure plates in it. Um, that's not going to slip when we give it full throttle. And that's an, in manoeuvring type conditions. You may be able to recreate those in an inspection, your first inspection or not, but you'll certainly want to do it on sea trial if you don't do it um, at the first inspection. Because the, the as I say, the replacement gearbox cost can be very expensive. Um, electrics. Oh, hang on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go stick with engine. Um, lack of you. Um, so sticking with the engines. A lack of a uh, uh, underused engine. So let's say you've turned up to a 40 year old boat. The owner says that the engines are original and they've got 150 hours on them. I'd say that's great. The core engine's going to be fantastic. 
but the ancillary components on the outside of the engine, all the coolers, the electrics, everything are all going to be kaput. All right, almost certainly. Um, so that's where we need to, to balance this um, low hour. Uh, we got excited, the engine haven't got any hours on. How, are they, how old is the engine with no hours on? Do you see what I'm getting? Um, cool, I think that's probably about it. Um, electrics, what do I um, want to inspect on the electrics? How the hell do I, first of all, turn everything on and prove that everything works? Basic bottom line, obvious stuff. Next thing, um, so this is like, have you got an inverter on there? Okay, can you show me it working? This is all gonna add into this, you know, this is where the price creep occurs at this stage. It's with these small little thousand dollars a piece. Every single job, thousand dollars a piece, all right? Um, what do I mean by that? There's a, it's a boat owner's joke that um, you go to do anything on a boat and it'll cost you a thousand dollars. It's, yeah, Murphy's Law sort of uh, thing I'm referring to. Okay, um, is the condition of the electrics on board very neat and tidy? Have a look in behind the, the main switchboard. Is it all neat and tidy and pretty? If, it, um, if it's all neat and tidy and pretty, and the components that I'm looking at, I recognize brand names like Mastervolt, Victron, um, there are so many out there. Have a, if, if you don't know an idea what you're looking at, take a photo, take a photo, take a photo, take a photo of all these components, go research them on the internet, Com cross compare them. If they're the top brand, um, top top end of the, the cost component, um, price points compared to all of the other stuff on the internet, you know you've got high quality things going on there, right? So we've if we've got high quality components on a tidy installation, we've probably got an okay electrical system. It is that obvious, okay? And there's not a lot other than it does everything work on this circuit that you can do in terms of inspection without getting an electrician level inspection going, all right? Whereas if you'd go, you're looking at, at unnamed brands with, forgive me, um, East Asian writing on them um, from, from factories producing cheap goods, and the installation is a bomb site. There's a bird's nest of wiring in behind the panel and you cannot tell what's happening. You're probably going to be wanting to sort that out at some point for your own sanity because that electrical system is going to break down, break down, break down, break down, cost you a fortune, cost you a fortune, cost you a fortune. All right. So that's that's all you can really do on this first inspection is just have a look around that. Um, and it will be as uh, what it states. Um, batteries on in the within the electric system again. Can the owner produce invoices as to when they were last replaced? And if that's within the last couple of years, great. But don't forget, I can quite easily you anybody can kill a set of batteries in a few months. Deep cycle batteries only have three hundred cycles from fully charged fully discharged in them on average yeah it doesn't matter what the technology of the battery is unless it's lithium all right lithium okay we can get tens of thousands of cycles out of them lead acid technology of any of its derivatives no matter what it's wrapped up in is if it's you know um magnesium foam um agm doesn't matter um 300 ish cycles all right out of the batteries if i find on board a 30 foot boat, a three kilowatt inverter, and one little house battery, big red flag. That battery is gonna have done some massive work to run that three kilowatt inverter, all right? The scale of the inverter is a big uh, flag fall event so how how many kilowatts is my the inverter that I'm looking at? If there's a little 300 watt inverter and the guy says I've only turned it on for an hour a day, or an hour every couple of weeks when I'm out sailing to charge my phone, no worries. And the battery bank is enormous. We're on a, on a winner. If the battery bank is tiny, 
and we've got a massive inverter installed in this boat big red flag those batteries are going to need changing probably get rid of <laughs> recover some cash out of that inverter um, there's a there's a massive conversation anyone who's been on the pearls of boating wisdom course will know we've got two days pretty much of talking about batteries and um, charging installations and all of the rest of it but those are the core takeaways for what am I looking at in this instant how big's the inverter versus the battery bank and what and, and what you want to be a little bit sort of surreptitious in order to get some honest answers is what do you use the inverter for and if you can see a galley full of electric hot plates and microwaves um, and toasters and kettles electric kettles you, you're what, what are exactly are you doing with this boat and, and how are you using it because it just means that the battery banks gonna be dead almost certainly the moment you unplug from shore power you're gonna have no capacity in those batteries in that scenario that I talked about um, how big is the solar panel what's how big is the wind charger is there a drogue a charging drogue on board the boat these are the sort of questions that are very much met with what do you want to do with the boat in the future all right and again <laughs> as I'm, I'm giggling about how long we spend on this during the course the 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 charging recharging of batteries question is is huge right um solar panels are not all they're cracked up to be they're brilliant at maintaining a system while we're away from the boat um, but to actually live off a set of solar panels you need a large amount of solar area um, to be able to do that so don't get hung up too much on that you're probably going to adjust it once you've got into the um, answered all of the questions and homeworks about what, what how big the solar panel array is okay um, that's it I've talked for nearly uh, 20 minutes all right uh, just a little wrap up then so um, what do I want to um, how do I bring all this together cost of purchase versus cost of um, what are all of these things now on my notepad gonna add up to when it comes time for me to, to dip, dip my hand in my pocket all right that's really where we're going with this pre-purchase boat inspection um, the color of the uh, of the curtains and the furnishings how grubby the boat is I would strongly counsel to never ever get hung up on that kind of stuff right um, because that's just a bucket of water away from being a ship shaped sparkly boat um, it's does the core bones of the boat you know where I'm going with the with the curtains and the and the, and the mold on the inside of the boat a coat of paint and a, and, and a, and a, a bucket and a weekend cleaning scrubbing and painting and um, you know your you can bring a boat up very quickly to, to what you want to see but you can't change the bones of a boat if you if you go buy a, um, a, a Volvo Ocean 70 with a five meter deep keel and you live in a harbor that's got um, one main shipping channel that's five meters deep you're going to be forever upset because all of your friends are off in their catamarans in the nice anchorages with their eight, 600 800 mil deep drafts yeah you can't change that the depth what well, you can change the depth of draft on on the follow ocean boat but the you get my point right um having buying a motorboat um with two three thousand horsepower ctex in them um and and not having the the revenue behind you to fill the tank to go out for a weekend you know uh, there's fundamentals and and don't yeah I hope I, I can communicate I'm communicating this idea that the bones of the boat can't be changed the color of the curtains can very easily all right so before you even go to the boat it's is this boat the thing that I'm looking for how many people do I want to take out with me where do I want to go and does this boat meet the needs of where I want to go right does it have the depth of draft the strength of hull to do what I want to do with it um, yeah is is it going to be fast enough for my needs this is a thing I'm, I'm personally going through and I hope I'm going to bring to this channel soon is um, we want to get to um, all the way around the world quickly because of 
various reasons. We've got family in the UK, we've got family here. All right, I don't have the revenue behind me to, to stay offshore for months and months on end. I need to get from New Zealand to, to the UK in a, in a month or two maximum, all right? So I need a boat that's capable of doing 16, 17 knots. Trimaran's very long, fast, um, sleek monohulls, all right? That's my only two options for doing this. Um, so it's what do you want to do with it and is it safe for doing so? Um, the Coast Guard uh, skipper in me just, yeah, it's, it's really sad when we see people go off and buy um, something uh, that's going to break up in, in the wrong conditions or something like that. Anyway, um, finishing on a high note um, at my 20 minute target, um, I hope this has been useful. Please leave your feedback in the, in the comments. Um, I, if you'd like me to go into any more detail as a priority, I will be doing all of the modules in the maintenance course um, over time. Hopefully a bit few more things to show you than just my ugly face um, talking to you. Um, but yeah, like, subscribe, all the rest of it. And thanks very much for watching.